it'll be just actually literally five people. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a very, very early session, and it's the final day of TechEd. So I am really thankful of your patience, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Dushyant Gill. Uh, I'm a program manager on the Windows Azure Active Directory team. Uh, all my life in Microsoft, uh, I joined in 2006. I've been on the Active Directory team. I started on the Windows server side of things uh, in uh, 2006. Uh, we were getting ready to ship Windows Server 2008, uh, big features like read-only domain controllers, etc. cetera. Uh, I also handled some of the uh, developer side of uh, Active Directory APIs, SDS, LDAP, ADSI. And then I moved to uh, learning to how to run services on the directory team of Office 365, which was also called MSODS, the Microsoft Services Online Directory Services. Uh, then I now am a part of uh, Windows Azure Active Directory uh, Secure Token Service. Uh, I own the SSO protocols, the single sign-on protocols, uh, SAML WS Fed, so authentication. And I also uh, am driving some of the authorization in the space. So that's about me. Uh, yeah, we are here to talk about, for 75 minutes, uh, how to secure your applications using Windows Azure Active Directory. Right? Uh, this uh, session is primarily focused on the developer. Uh, even though I, I will cover some part of uh, what the role of Windows Azure Active Directory is, what the scenario is, what problems it solves, uh, there is going to be some slideware related to that. I think that slideware is also important to set the perspective. Uh, but really, we're, we're going to dive deep into uh, developing applications and integrating those applications with uh, Windows Azure AD. So it's going to be pretty demo-driven. There's going to be coding involved, too, right? So I, I, uh, early on, I asked questions, how many of you were developers? So I know about the two of you and about you. How about the rest of you? How many of you are developers? Developers as in who write code for a living? Fantastic. You too? OK. All right. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I hope you'll be able to take a lot away from the session, uh, the developer side of things. And I hope you'll get something out too as an architect, right? Uh, let's go. So really, that's, that's the business uh, my team has been in for the past 15 years, trying to answer these three questions for applications out there. Right? Every application worth its salt now uh, wants to answer these three questions as soon as a user walks up to that application. Who are you? Uh, what are you permitted? What are you allowed to do? And what all do I know about you? Uh, depending on the answers of these questions, uh, the application basically makes decisions on uh, uh, who are you, meaning what the authentication side of things, what are you allowed to do, the authorization, and uh, what all do I know about you, the profile information, your friends of friends, your manager, your office phone, your blah, all of that. Right? Uh, in Active Directory server product, we, have, we had all of this clubbed into one thing, uh, Kerberos uh, Secure Channel doing the who are you part of it, uh, uh, the authorization happening through uh, security groups uh, in the token, and uh, of course, the LDAP directory providing the profile of all of the users of the organization also to the application. So it was, it was pretty magical uh, when Active Directory actually got deployed. Uh, the identities of the users and the machines which got domain joined were very portable. Everywhere they went within the enterprise, within the LAN, they were recognized. Applications, the developers just had to write the application and this magic called secure channel and uh, integrated auth uh, just handled all the authentication for them and uh, they received things like iPrinciple in their code, which had all the security groups and the security context associated to the identity, right? So it was great as long as uh, we were dealing with uh, the world inside that box. Really, I, I call, the, uh, call the slide omnipresence of Windows Server AD 
Even then, it was not omnipresent. As soon as we wanted to write an application uh, to serve our partners and customers, we knew how difficult it was to take Active Directory to the extranet. Right? So as soon as uh, things went outside of the intranet, of this beautiful bubble, and on the wrong side of the firewall, uh, Active Directory was not really omnipresent. Right? Uh, and uh, one of the things which is uh, pushing us to basically solve this problem more and more, or the things which are falling on the wrong side of the firewall more and more, is uh, the beautiful cloud, which is not uh, in that box. And all of the applications that you're uh, purchasing, your customers are purchasing, uh, or the applications that you're building, uh, whether it's for your own, your own organization or applications that you're building, uh, for uh, other organizations uh, if you're building them in the cloud, uh, which is pretty lucrative. I mean, the cloud economics are great. They're fantastic. I don't have to bring down my service to reset the password of a service principle or to patch my servers. That's, all of that is taken away. It doesn't matter whether it's the Microsoft cloud or another cloud out there, right? So the, the, the move is towards these applications, and uh, we needed to provide a story for all of the things which Active Directory provided in the enterprise for these applications. We had to solve this problem ourselves as Microsoft for the services that we were building, Office 365, Dynamic CRM, Azure, uh, and all of, uh, uh, Intune, SQL Azure. All of these services required uh, to have access to the identities. So really, that's, that's how Windows Azure AD was born. This is uh, one of those slide ways where basically it talks about how it's extending the notion of uh, Windows Azure Active Directory to the cloud with the capabilities that Active Directory provide. And you saw a similar slide in Girish's presentation on the first day introducing Windows Azure AD also, basically providing uh, answers to who are you, what are you permitted to do, what do I know about you, to the applications about the business user in the cloud now yet making it easy for the enterprise uh, and the businesses to be able to manage those identities. Right? So what is really Azure Active Directory? This is a busy slide. I apologize, but, but let's, let's start uh, uh, from the left-hand side. Yeah. So th those are our customers, right? Uh, the small businesses, the medium, large enterprises, the schools and the universities. Uh, Girish gave out a number of uh, uh, 3 million tenants that we already host in Windows Azure Active Directory. It's, it's a, a, a combination of all of these different customers. And uh, all of these identities, we basically, what we've provided in Windows Azure AD is it's a multi-tenant online service. It's a directory service in the cloud. It's a free directory service in the cloud where any of these customers can go sign up for a directory tenant in Windows Azure AD, which looks and feels just as a directory for their uh, company, even though it's a part of this multi-tenant online service. Uh, and they can start to manage their identities now in this directory. They can start to manage their identities in this directory using various different mechanisms. A small business which does not have any um, on-premise uh, collateral of uh, IT software or uh, identity software can manage all their identities only in the cloud. So I just go, uh, bring up my online uh, Azure Active Directory and start to create identities, manage identities. A medium large business uh, uh, enterprise which has more than, say, 1,000 users, it's not practical to manage 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 identities only in the cloud using UI or PowerShell. They can connect their existing uh, Active Directories on-premises to their, uh, their directory in the cloud and manage using their existing processes, whatever they've been following. Dersync uh, is the tool which basically takes all the changes, brings it to the cloud. It also brings the data to the cloud. And there's multiple mechanisms in which uh, the uh, enterprises and businesses and schools, universities can 
create single sign-on. Uh, you can create single sign-on using this new mechanism which we've released, which is called password hash sync. It's not really password hash, password hash hash sync, a uh, very secure mechanism. But if there's uh, a pure federation requirements uh, for the enterprise, they can federate the sign-on of Azure Active Directory with uh, an ADFS server on-premise or even a shibboleth server on-premise. Really, any uh, federation server which uh, follows WS Fed and SAML protocol on-premise, uh, Azure Active Directory federates with that server to uh, basically offload the authentication and single sign-on to that server. So that's how, on the left-hand side, businesses are able to connect to their directory tenants, provide single sign-on, and manage their directory. Right? On this side, what it's meant to do, really. It's meant to provide all of those capabilities to applications which you're writing. And these are the modern applications in the cloud, the web applications, the web APIs, the rich client applications, and the protocols it supports. Those uh, top protocols are for single sign-on, federation metadata, I'll talk about admin consent, and there's OAuth 2.0, and uh, the REST API, uh, REST-based API, what we call the directory graph API, using which applications can query the directory, right? So that's Azure Active Directory for you. Uh, this slide, uh, part of it has been covered by Girish, but I'll quickly skim over it. Uh, uh, these numbers are a little older. He had updated numbers on his slide. But it does give you a perspective on how mature the service already is. Right? Running as uh, the underpinning for Office 365 uh, gives us a lot of experience. We have uh, great worldwide presence. Uh, uh, the availability numbers are very high for the past. This is for the past three months I've taken. And uh, I wanted to show you this uh, chart below, or rather the timeline below. Uh, a lot of those tags might not make sense to you, but, but really what they are down there are um, big, chunky feature releases that we've done after we've GA'd in April. GA meaning uh, made Azure Active Directory generally available in April. Since then, we've made so many big, chunky feature releases in all these different areas. So that, that shows something about the pace of our innovation also. Uh, we have a huge team working on this, so... Uh, we better release at this pace the innovation. Right? Let's get down to it now uh, on actually uh, writing an application which uh, integrates with Windows Azure AD and uh, provides single sign-on to its users, the crux of our session today. And uh, let's get down to the uh, demo scenario. So what... Uh, oh, interesting. Okay, so the, I think this is uh, uh, an older version of the slide, but there's a slight change. What I decided to do was uh, give the demo using only one application because I was running out of time on my uh, complete timeline. And that application is the ASP.NET application, but I've, I have a PHP application on the side which I'll show to you in the end, which I'll not demo uh, regularly. So the first thing, basically, what I want to show you is how a developer... Uh, walks up to Windows Azure Active Directory and registers their application, right? the first application they want to create. So in this scenario, we are uh, looking at uh, a directory tenant which the developer's organization has. right? So the developer organization's Windows Azure AD, uh, and that's where the developer will register this application. Let's do that. So I go to Windows Azure, and uh, for this demonstration, I'm going to use my personal account. And I'll act as the developer registering my application. Yeah? So I go to my directory. and go to my applications and say add an application. Right? The first thing it asks me is what is the uh, access need of your application, single sign-on only, or do you want to also uh, access the directory? 
let's just leave it at single sign-on because I'm not going to show you graph today. And WS Web Decad. The second thing it asks me is what's the app URL and the app ID URI. Let's provide that. Let's spin up an application in Visual Studio. I'm going to create a NASP.NET MVC4 application, .NET Framework 4.5. Let's call it WS Fed TechEd and choose an intranet application with Windows authentication or Windows Azure authentication, Razor Engine. All right. First thing, basically, I will do is I'll go to properties and enable SSL. Now, the reason I enable SSL here is uh, uh, we'll, we'll see in the future slides uh, the way federation works is the token which the user takes to the application, uh, which basically proves his identity, his or her identity, uh, is a bearer token that does not in any way uh, basically, the, uh, have a proof of possession inside it. Anybody who's bearing it is that identity. So it's very important for us to have all of this uh, communication over secure channel. So we will enable SSL. It's very easy in ASP.NET, and uh, most other IDEs are making it simple to enable SSL. So I've done that. Let's change the launch of this project also to... SSL instead, and we have our app URL. Okay, so the, the first app URL, uh, or rather the local host app URL, anybody can register for their application for development purposes, and that's basically the app registration. So I've, I've created an application uh, in my directory. What I've really ended up doing is uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, like basic identity federation concepts? Yeah, so yeah, basically what I've done here is uh, in terms of identity federation, there's the identity provider, which is the directory, and there's the relying party, which I'm creating, which is my application, and I have introduced or registered my relying party to the identity provider. A basic first step of creating a federation between two parties is the parties need to basically introduce uh, themselves to each other and register uh, in each other's domain. So I've registered my application, the relying party in the identity provider. And uh, yeah, so let's go back and see what it told me. Basically what it gave me is uh, the metadata which I can now, metadata document which I can now use to introduce the other side of the equation, which is the introduce the identity provider to my application, right? My application needs to be configured to talk to Windows Azure AD, and that's where I can use this metadata. Let's quickly take a look at it. So it's a WS Fed uh, SAML metadata. That's the signature. That's the role descriptor of the uh, uh, STS. And that's the SAML IDP SSO descriptor, which has the single logout and the single sign on endpoints of the uh, STS, Secure Token Service. And it also has this uh, signing key using which the uh, IDP will sign the tokens. So for the validation of the tokens, the application will use the signing key. Uh, and it has the entity descriptor, which has the issuer of the token is going to be HTTPS, stswindows.net, and this GUID, which is the tenant ID. Now, if you actually change this from this GUID to which is the name, a registered name of my domain, workaad.onmicrosoft.com, it's the same thing. So basically the metadata handler gives the metadata for 
if you specify the name of a registered name of the domain or any registered name works here. I've registered an additional name, which is workad.com. It'll give the same information, basically. And uh, uh, we recommend using, if you have the information of the tenant ID GUID with you, we recommend using that because that's an immutable identifier of the tenant which will not change, right? But basically, that's the metadata. Now, this metadata is parsable by machines. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our app to this metadata by copying this and saying identity and access. So this is a tool which uh, really has been released to make configuration of uh, uh, identity uh, uh, framework which integrates with Windows Azure AD easier. Uh, everything this does, this tool does, we can do manually also, and we'll go over what all this tool does. Right? So we'll basically put the path of the STS uh, metadata document here. And the configuration is done. Let's actually, before we look at the configuration, let's quickly hit run and see what this does. So what we've done here is uh, we've created a blank MVC application with intranet authentication, and we've used this identity and access tool to point the application to the metadata document of AAD, of the developer's organization. And there was some configuration happening uh, in the background, and we've hit F5. That's, those are the steps we've done. Right? This is good. I'm going to ignore this because my, this is my development box. And just with that, what, what has happened is the authentication of my application has been transferred onto Azure Active Directory. And this is login.microsoftonline.com, uh, which is basically Azure Active Directory login page. Right? So uh, uh, during the course of this uh, session, I'm going to uh, log in multiple times. What I'd love if you could do is see how many different kinds of logins I'm going to be doing. So this is the first uh, login which I'll do is the developer has written his application now. He's released it. Let's suppose and a user from his organization wants to sign in. Right. So the application has the user, hello, user. Uh, the user signed in. The application used uh, all of the magic which we configured using that tool to create single sign-on for the user. Right? Now let's take a look at what the tool did. Right? Actually, let's, let me go back to my slides and show you this part, right? Basically, this, this is where we are. Right? We, we're doing the web single sign-on part of this, where the user from the developer's organization is signing on to the application. Again, uh, all of these slides are going to have two applications, uh, the single tenant PHP and single tenant ASP.NET. I've decided to do only ASP.NET for this demo, and we'll do PHP later, yeah? So yeah, basically, this is what we were doing. Uh, we configured this. Now, uh, for single sign-on, all of these different technologies provide ways uh, to configure single sign-on with uh, these basic identity providers in an easy way. Uh, simple SAML PHP is uh, a nice framework for PHP. Open SAML is a good framework for uh, uh, Java. Uh, WIF, Windows Identity Foundation, is uh, a great framework for uh, ASP.NET. Right? So what uh, we're using, the identity access tool, what it used in the background was Windows Identity Foundation and configured the single sign-on magic with Azure Active Directory using WS Fed Lollipop there and uh, Windows Identity Foundation. If we would have used simple SAML PHP, it would have used the SAML 2.0 Lollipop on the, uh, on the directory and uh, basically configured federation using SAML, right? So yeah, Azure Active Directory supports both of those kinds of federations. OK, let's go back to our demo machine. and look at what happened in the background. Right? So as soon as we configured that, what uh, the identity access tool, and 
let me tell you, it's, it's becoming easier and easier to configure using Windows Identity Foundation because my team is innovating every day. In fact, uh, a build conference is happening in parallel in San Francisco, uh, in parallel with the Tech Ed conference here. And uh, in that conference, we've released one another uh, new avatar of this tool, which is making it even easier to configure your Azure Active Directory and single sign-on uh, from Visual Studio. So I, this, this is it, we're literally uh, innovating at a very high pace. So you're going to see a lot of uh, things we're going to do to make it easy to develop and integrate with AAD. Let's take a look at this one, right? So what it basically did was it added the WSFed authentication module. Let me zoom in a little. And the session authentication module uh, removes the forms off uh, in WSFed to basically any unauthenticated request coming to the application will be forwarded using the session authenticated module to uh, Azure Active Directory, and WSFed authentication module will basically do the uh, federation dance. And then it took all of the information that I provided to it, which was the federation metadata, and the information from within federation metadata it parsed and it put in this section of the web.config, which is the system.identity model. It added what my URI is, the audience. Uh, it added the thumbprint of the certificate, which is the authority is going to use to sign the tokens. The authority with the tenant ID GUID. If I, again, if I change this GUID to workaad.com or workaad.onmicrosoft.com, it will just keep working. And it added the valid issuers. Valid issuers is basically in the tokens that this app will receive, what are the valid issuers that it needs to check against? And that's pretty much it, right? All of the rest of the magic was done by uh, WIF in the background. OK, let's, uh, we've, we're talking a lot about this federation metadata, right? Let's see what other purpose it serves. So one thing with these keys, these keys is they roll, right? And when keys roll, applications which are having the older keys they will break if they do not refresh the new key in their application, because they're going to be using this key to validate the tokens which are incoming. And uh, uh, what they'll need to do is keep the metadata on their side refreshed. So let me show you a walkthrough that we have prepared. So I'm going to the MSDN website of, uh, rather, MSDN page of Windows Azure AD. In April, when we made AD, uh, Windows Azure AD generally available, we created these nice, I call them beautiful, we put a lot into them, walkthroughs where you can basically go and exercise various functionalities of Windows Azure AD using these walkthroughs step by steps. So what I'm going to exercise right now from this is the automatic metadata refresh. What this basically does is if the STS refreshes its keys, right? or any other federation metadata uh, 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 element changes, what this code will do is basically it runs uh, in global.asax uh, on application on start. What this code will do is it will refresh the metadata information that it has about Windows Azure AD on a regular basis. Let's. Do a build, okay. I need to add a reference, I believe. Let's just add services also. Okay, so yeah, basically what this code will do is it'll run an application on start and it'll refresh the metadata by this is, again, a class provided in Windows Identity Framework, which reads the metadata and adds or refreshes, writes to the config, which is our web.config, the valid issuer name registry. Let's try this out. Let's actually, let's do this. Let's change the certificate on our side and assume that the certificate on the STS side has changed. Basically, there's a mismatch in the metadata. And let's see what happens. Right? 
So I was at the login page, everything was fine then, but as soon as, oh, actually, everything worked. Let me, oh, okay. So basically what it did, uh, if I would have shown this to you uh, before adding the metadata refresh, uh, this uh, would not have worked. What it did was basically, it saw there was a mismatch between the two metadatas, and it pulled the new metadata, and it updated my web.config, and used that uh, certificate again to validate the token. So if, if that code would not have been there, Let's not let the code out. So that's the kind of experience I was looking for, where basically it'll give me this uh, It, it basically says no valid key mapping found for, I'm sure you'll have a much better error page in your application, but it says the key uh, mismatch has occurred. It's very important for applications to keep the metadata fresh from the IDP and have some mechanism to keep it up to date because IDPs will roll their signing keys, right? So let's put that refresh back in place and Let's go to our slides. OK, so we just saw uh, uh, a user sign on from this organization. You know what, before, before we leave, I want to show you one more kind of sign on experience, rather b before we leave this part of the. So I've, I haven't done much uh, in this application. All I've done is configured sign on with Windows Azure AD. But suddenly, there's this uh, user in my organization uh, which has been configured with uh, multi-factor auth, right? And my application did not have to do anything to to sign in the user in a special way. Thank you. <laughs> I would have struggled with it for a long time. So yeah, I've, I've, I've done nothing. It's all Windows Azure AD providing these various different kinds of sign-on experiences to my application, and my application is just able to take advantage of them. Right? It's not doing anything special for them. Well, I hope my roaming works. And, uh, Microsoft sign-in verification system. Press the pound key to finish signing in. You have been signed in. Goodbye. Fantastic. All right. So this, that's, that's the kind of capabilities which Windows Azure AD is providing uh, every day on the authentication endpoint, additional capabilities to the applications. And applications, again, don't have to do anything to take advantage of all this. It just keeps working. So that's the second kind of sign-in experience. Let's go back to here and see where our demo is going. OK. Uh, it's uh, when, when WIF does its magic, or when simple SAML PHP does its magic, it's, uh, it just happens under the covers. But really, nowadays, with these new technologies coming every day, uh, it's, sometimes it's good to just understand what the basics of the uh, magic underneath is, so that you can then apply it to any other uh, uh, new technology that you're uh, basically uh, evaluating, right? The federation dance, which people call, is uh, nothing but uh, HTTP messages being exchanged by these three entities, right? And the three entities being the user, the application, and uh, the identity provider, which we'll see uh, in a minute. So the first step here was the user basically clicked or tried to get a resource uh, from the relying party or the resource web app. The resource web app realized it is an unauthenticated user, and it had some mechanism to say that user 
you will go to Windows Azure AD. Uh, if it's a multi-tenant app and it has multiple identity providers which it's integrating with, it will have some a little bit more complicated logic to identify where to send the user. But basically, the app makes a decision to send the user to the appropriate identity provider. And it's nothing but an HTTP redirect, which it issues to the user, uh, depending on the protocol. That's the kind of message that it looks like, right? SAML request or uh, WA, WT Realm, and WCT. Uh, a WS Fed request, which makes a get on the identity provider, which is Windows Azure AD in our case. Uh, and Windows Azure AD, what it does is, if it needs to authenticate the user, again, I say if it needs to authenticate, the user might have authenticated with uh, Office 365. And on, on another tab, he might have opened your application. The user will just sign in. Uh, but if the authentication is required, Windows Azure AD will do the authentication. And that's where all the magic of multi-factor auth or federated auth all of that will happen. Uh, and once the user has been authenticated, Windows Azure AD basically uh, does this uh, uh, JavaScript post on the user's browser, which is basically a form with uh, hidden elements, which has the response, uh, which is basically the token, the SAML response, or the W result, uh, which renders on the user's browser. If JavaScript has not been enabled, the user will see some ugly thing. But most browsers have JavaScript enabled. And this does a post to the resource web app. The token is taken to the resource web app. The resource web app validates the token. And the token validation is where what we saw in the web config, where, ah, this is a valid issuer. The certificate, the signature on the token is valid. It is meant for me and the audience. Ah, good, OK. So token validation happens. I get the claims out of the token. I get the identity of the user. And I sign in the user. Sign in usually involves in setting a cookie to the user. You would have expected that the app at this stage will just send a 200 OK. But usually what apps do is they do a 300, 302 redirect to set the cookie. And they post, uh, or rather they redirect the user on the same page or another page to set the cookie of the app and then bring the user back. If you see, number six is very similar to number one, but now it has the auth cookie of the app set, and then the user accesses the application. That was uh, the whole WS Fed, the federation dance, or the SAML dance. Uh, depending on the binding, that can change a little bit, but that's, that's the basics of it. This was uh, the token which was posted. I've uh, opened the token up uh, in WS Fed and in SAML. It's the same token format. Uh, I've opened the token up uh, in WS Fed. You don't see it. You just see the claims principle come to you and everything uh, you do on the claims principle. But if you're using another technology, you might actually get exposed to the token. It has a name ID, which is uh, an opaque identifier, really, for every, uh, for every app. It's different for the user, but it's same within the app. Uh, it has the audience field set. Uh, it, these are the default claims which are available in the token, uh, the name, uh, which is the user principal name or the email address of the user, uh, the tenant ID, and the object identifier. The object ID is uh, very similar to the object ID in AD. It's the unique identifier for each ob object in the directory. And uh, we actually recommend that you use object identifier uh, claim for authorization in your app. So whenever you're assigning permissions to identities, uh, always use the object identifier and not one of the uh, non-immutable ones like name, which can change, right? I'll not go into much detail here. I'm showing the federation metadata. I showed you already zooming in. Basically, there's the SAML part of it, there's the WS Fed part of it, and there's the entity ID. Uh, in this example, ah, yeah. So one, one thing I'll, I'll call out here is that even though we accessed a tenant-specific metadata endpoint in our demo, there is a common metadata endpoint also. And all of those, like all of the endpoints which I showed to you, SAML, WS Fed, all of those have a common uh, tenant-independent endpoints also uh, with them. So you can, uh, without doing the disambiguation of which tenant you belong to, if you're writing a multi-tenant app with Windows Azure AD, you can just post the uh, request to the common endpoint, and uh, Windows Azure AD will do the disambiguation of which tenant uh, the user belongs to. 
OK, so let's see sign out. How much time do I have? I think I'm good. So I'll, I'll use the same, uh, I'll use the same uh, uh, documentation which we have put out there to quickly configure sign out for my application. And this basically tells me how I should uh, go create a sign out controller. So I'll go, I'll add. Right, and uh, and in the sign out controller, I will How many of you are familiar with MVC programming pattern? I see. Oh, that's very good. I'm not very familiar. So I'm, I'm going to use this uh, uh, nice walkthrough that we've created. Uh, I, I'm still in ASP.NET fixed on that. Uh, yeah, basically it asked me to create a sign-out controller. The next thing I do is uh, I'll explain this later. I'll add a sign-out view. Okay. And I'll call that a sign out view, all right. Sorry? Should I zoom in? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Oh, my bad. Oh, my bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, basically what I did was uh, I created a sign-out controller and a sign-out view. Actually, let me show you what I did here. I added a new controller called sign-out controller. From my nice walkthrough, I added the code for the sign-out controller here to my controller. I'll explain what it does. And then I created a sign-out view. And I'm going to update the sign-out view with the uh, it tells me, ah, simple. Just tell the user you have been successfully signed out. OK. There's a couple of uh, additional things which I need to do for sign out to work. There's, uh, what happens with sign out is when I click on sign out, sign out completes, and AAD redirects the user back to my sign out page. So my sign out page has to, be, uh, has to allow users to access it unauthenticated. Otherwise, it will just keep sending the user back to AAD. So what I'll do is I'll add an exception for authentication in my web.config for sign out. Right? So I'll allow unauthenticated users. And finally, I'll just add something to trigger the sign out in my application. So there. I'll replace the login section with what my walkthrough told me. So what? let's see what all we've done. So in my uh, layout, common layout, I've changed the login section to show the sign-out link. Right? In my sign-out view, I'm showing them, ah, you've been successfully signed out. And in the controller, here is where I'm creating a sign-out message and posting that message. I'm also uh, basically calling sign out on my own session authentication module to uh, delete the session cookie. And then I redirect the user to the sign out page. Or rather, the sign out, I send the sign out message. Let's see how this works.
So now the user has this thing called sign out right next to the page. Oh, sorry, right next to his uh, name on the page. Click on it, and it shows we have successfully signed out. We had added an exception to allow unauthenticated users, so it says you're not authenticated. So that's basically sign out, which we've configured. Not this one. I'll switch to here. Right. So uh, th that was uh, uh, some additional code that we wrote for WS Fed. And uh, similar code can, can be written for SAML. One tricky thing with SAML, if you're developing uh, your app with SAML, is that SAML requires sign-out messages to be signed. So the sign-out messages, which uh, the relying party sends to the identity provider, needs to be signed, uh, and uh, that's for the protocol. It's a must. So what needs to happen is the identity provider needs to know of the signing key that the relying party will use. Uh, in that case, the relying party has to bring up a federation document of its own so that AAD can basically get the key from there and validate sign-out messages coming from the relying party. So if you're ever writing a SAML app uh, and you want to configure sign-out for that app, uh, you will have to uh, basically bring up this metadata document and put up the sign, uh, give the signing key to AAD. OK, let's look at the swim lane for uh, sign-out. Sign-out basically was user initiates the sign-out on the resource web app. Resource web app does a similar redirect. In this case, it basically sends a sign-out message instead of a single sign-on message to users. Uh, and it also does a clear cookie, what we did with WIF. Uh, in uh, SAML, you see I've added the signature and the signature algorithm. That's a must. But in WS Fed, signature is not required for sign-out messages. It's much simpler to implement uh, sign-out with WS Fed. And this does the redirect to AAD. In distributed sign-outs, what AAD does is uh, if the user clicks sign-out on your app and the user is signed in to a another relying party of uh, Azure AD on the side, say Office 365 or Azure. Uh, what Azure AD will do is uh, do a sign out on all those applications also. So the way it does is basically it uses, uh, and it's, it's a fairly common uh, mechanism in the industry, it uses an iframe mechanism in the user's browser uh, to get, broadcast these sign out messages to all those relying parties. Uh, if it's a SAML relying party, then it will send a SAML sign-out message. If it's a WS Fed relying party, it will send a WS Fed sign-out message. But basically what it will do is it will identify all of the relying parties in the session and send a broadcast sign-out to all of those and reply back with the sign-out response. In the case of WS Fed, it's a very simple, just redirect me back to the uh, web page which has been configured. In the case of uh, SAML, the message is again signed. And uh, the SAML response comes to the relying party, and the relying party gets it. And that's it. That's as simple as the sign out flow is. Any questions? Till now. I'm, I'm blazing through all of these different swim lanes and technologies and the code which I'm uh, taking from the walkthroughs. If you have any questions, you can interrupt me. And uh, if I'll cover it in the future, I'll just hold there. Otherwise, I'll answer the question right now, yeah? So feel free to stop me. OK, let's talk about uh, multi-tenant applications, or what are also referred to as uh, uh, software as a service, uh, ISV applications, right? Now, these multi-tenant applications could be applications that your organization is purchasing, or it could be organization that you, uh, or sorry, applications that you are building to sell to other organizations. And if you, uh, look, uh, if you uh, look at the previous slide, which I want to show you here, let me see if I can. So if you see this slide, uh, given the kind of integrations that we have available for our customers to integrate with the uh, uh, AAD, and all of this is available for your application for free, uh, it's a pretty lucrative thing to, uh, when you're building applications, 
which you want to sell to other organizations to support or integrate with Windows, Windows Azure AD because it makes existing enterprises, which are 89% of enterprises, that's the number I heard last, uh, are using AD. It makes it pretty easy for uh, organizations to connect. And even non-AD organizations, which are not using AD, which are using regular LDAP directory and Shibboleth, can connect to Azure AD and extend their uh, uh, reach to the cloud. So it's, it's pretty lucrative to write applications uh, using Windows Azure AD or integrating with Windows Azure AD for all of the identity management and offloading the identity management to Azure AD. So let's talk about what multi-tenant applications are. Right? So the first thing, the, and from, again, from the application developer's point of view, the first thing the application developer does is once you basically you have your organization's uh, uh, Windows Azure AD, you've registered your application in that, you designate the application to be made externally available, externally available to other organizations also. So the way you do it is, let's take a look. Let's close this for now. Let's go back to my application, WS Fed Tech Ed, and uh, let's configure it. Right? When I go to configuration of my application, I see that I can change the local host app URL. I can change this because when I make my application externally available, I will have to change this. Right? I can add a logo to it, and then I can say, Designate whether the users in external organizations are allowed to grant your app access to the data. Basically, what it means is make this application available to external users. So as soon as I say on and save it, it says app ID URI is not available. The app ID URI must be from a verified domain within your organization's directory. What that means is that this app ID URI, which is the identity of your application, needs to belong under one of the registered domains which you have registered with AAD. So if you see my tenant, I have registered one domain, which is workaad.com. So I can have externally facing applications which have app ID URIs only under workaad.com. This is meant so that you do not squat on names which do not belong to you, right? Or other people don't squat on names that belong to you, right? I think that's a more politically correct way of saying it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, basically to safeguard the names of your applications, you, can, uh, you need to prove ownership of that name, only then you can do this. And the way you add a registered domain is through DNS verification, which is pretty standard again. And I've added my work AD. Let me show you a multi-tenant app which I have created. So this multi-tenant app has the app URL. I've added a logo, and uh, it basically is externally available. Uh, it requires single sign-on and read access. It has its client ID, and there's a URL for granting access. And the app ID URI it belongs to one of the domains which I've registered, and my other things which are registered here. So let's take a look at this application and see what all this is. Before that, I want to switch to this and proceed with our, yeah. Basically, what we've seen now is, we've, what we've seen is uh, a developer uh, add an application or designate an application to be made externally available. Now what we'll see is, how does that application get installed on the customer's tenant? How does the customers uh, go and uh, install that application to integrate that application with their own AAD, right? Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you think about this, uh, today the way it happens, or for a long time the way this has been happening for a SaaS application to create federation with the customers on premise, it's uh, here's a connector which connects with your ADFS or your Ping Federate or your Shibboleth. Please spin up this connector or hire, uh, pay $3,500 to this consultant who can do this for you and uh, uh, have another stream going up to the cloud from your uh, uh, on-premise AD. 
and uh, please post us uh, a, a nightly FTP uh, dump of your users so that we can synchronize your users also in our application, right? AAD makes it much simpler. What we're going to see is how can an application now uh, integrate with the Active Directory of a customer which wants to buy that application. So let's go there. Basically what happens is the customer goes through a consent flow, right? And that consent flow uh, installs a presence of that application in their tenant of Windows Azure AD. And this tenant is, I, I draw them as two separate directories. They are two different tenants of Windows Azure AD. And uh, in reality, what happens is uh, there's the application object which belongs to each application, which resides in the tenant where the application was born. And there's a service principle which is created in every tenant where the application is installed. So this red thing here, after the consent flow happens, uh, is actually a service principle object which gets created in this tenant and is assigned permissions on whether or not the service principle is allowed to uh, read data, uh, read or write data, or only provide, uh, do single sign-on, depending on the permissions which the tenant has given to that application. Yeah? So let's uh, come back here and see what I'm talking about in terms of... So there's, there's this thing called URL for granting access. Let's take a look at what it is. So my application, when I made it externally available, there was something which Azure told me that this is the URL for granting access. That URL is nothing but a consent URL, which is receiving the client ID of your application, the requested permissions that your application requests, and where should the user be returned to when the consent completes. What it means is that in your application on the front page, if you have something like connect using your Windows Azure AD, there's this icon there, right? If, you, if the user, if the customer who wants to connect their uh, uh, directory with your application clicks on that connect using your Active Directory, this is the URL they will be sent to. The URL will have the client ID of your application, the requested permissions that you request, and the consent return, which is after the consent has happened, whether access given or denied, where should the user be redirected to after this? This consent is usually a part of application purchase when the credit card is swiped or when the evaluation is started, right? So your app is going to have this uh, page called Start Evaluation, and in between, there's going to be single sign-on and directory federation, connect using your AAD, consent flow, coming back here. Let's take a look at it. By default, I had configured my app using directory readers, but there's a secret. I can have a default permission for my application, which also shows up here. If you remember, when I had configured my application, I had said only give single sign-on to the other one. In this one, I had given uh, single sign-on and directory read, so this is directory readers. But depending on how much the user is allowing your application at runtime, you can actually change this. If the user uh, wants to allow you uh, directory read, you can add directory read there. If the user says, ah, oh, I'm ready to integrate with my AD, but I don't want to give you directory read, only single sign-on, you can switch this to only single sign-on and send the consent that way. So it's, it's configurable, basically. It's not fixed, right? So I've created a tenant where I have never consented my application to. So my application is, let me show you. Ah, not this one. Let's start and in private. That's the multi-tenant application I've created. It's an ASP.NET application, not MVC. Uh, and it's an app you can use yourself to exercise all of the SSO flows. Basically, it's a tool. It's developer tools uh, which you can use against your own directory tenant to post SSO messages, 
uh, and uh, use uh, both SAML and WS Fed and do role management, et cetera, in your application. You can, you can try this out if you want. But basically what I was referring to is you can initiate a consent where you can designate any of these, and this is my application creating these URLs, but basically the consent, what it does is, let me show you here, paste that URL I got from there. The first thing the user will see as soon as the user clicks connect using your AD is the sign-in page. Now here, the user needs to be either an administrator of the tenant who is going to connect your app to the tenant or uh, a user which has been authorized to basically go through the consent flow, right? So let's, let's see another sign-in uh, mechanism in AAD where I've actually spun up a shibboleth server on one of my Windows Azure VMs, and I've uh, brought up this tenant called edutenant.com. I'm trying to make it like a university kind of tenant, so I'm going to name, uh, I've named the user principal at edu tenant. We've never seen a federated flow. What, what happens in a federated flow is as soon as AAD sees that, ah, you belong to a, a user which is federated identity, it sends you to the identity provider of the organization, right? So we're seeing a mechanism, another sign-in flow here uh, of federation, but using uh, shibboleth federation and not ADFS federation. So basically, what, where the principal has been sent to is his shibboleth server. He's going to sign on in his shibboleth server. and come to AAD and see this uh, consent flow. The consent basically says, uh, access data in EDU's tenant. Are you sure you want to allow single sign-on and read directory? The app has been published by blah, blah, blah. Do you trust the Shangil? If you do, the logo is there, you grant access, right? That's where the service principle of my app will actually get created in edutenant.com, which is a university customer of mine, which I want to uh, add. So actually, we'll, we'll see another sign-in flow uh, later on where the federation, huh. <laughs> OK, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll show you what, what really happened here. Uh, but basically, what, what happened is the consent was granted. Let me take this and show that to you. So what comes back is consent granted and the tenant ID. What my application received back once the consent was granted by EDU tenant is the consent has been granted, and this is the tenant ID which has consented to your application. Usually what an application will do at this stage is make a query to the Graph API, get additional details about the tenant, and um, if it wants to load the directory data of the tenant, yes, but basically it'll get more information of the tenant, right? What had happened there is the default uh, page that it redirects back to this one, the de default link which uh, the URL for granting access which is created here in Azure, takes your uh, reply URL. This one. So it sent back the consent to my inbound SAML auth and response for my application, which doesn't handle consents. I have another page for handling consent, so I should have sent a custom consent request. But basically what, what happened was the consent was granted, my application received the consent uh, tenant ID, and I can then onboard this new service principle. This, now that the user basically has consented to my application, let me close this. Other, that's okay. Other users from that uh, tenant can now sign in. Let's do that. So this is my workad.com, which has which somebody just consented to in edutenant.com. This is how you sign into my application by sending a SSO request. But basically now the dean at edutenant.com can also sign in, and the dean is apparently not an administrator here.
Right? So what I get back is Dean at EDO Tenant, who's signed in, who's a new user from the, uh, from the EDU tenant, which has just signed up for my application, and I got all the claims from the token. And that's how the consent happens. Let me show you one more sign-in experience before we call it a day. This time, I'm going to sign in using a tenant which I created called federatedtenant.com, which uses ADFS federation. So it is managing its identities using AD on-premise, but it has deployed an ADFS server. So let's... So again, uh, uh, Microsoft Online says, ah, you're federatedtenant.com, you need to sign in at your organization's ADFS server, and I've created this ADFS server on another virtual machine in Windows Azure. Uh, and basically, all the users from that organization are sent to Aaron Co. the organization's federation server to sign in. And the same web SSO works for your application for all these different sign-in mechanisms which AAD employs. Right? So what we saw today was Azure AD uh, integrating with uh, various different kinds of tenants or having different kinds of tenants in Azure AD, this EDU tenant, which was having a shibboleth uh, deployed on-premise like a university, a federated tenant having an ADFS server, or this very well could have been a ping federate server uh, deployed on-premise, a large organization, uh, a managed organization completely in the cloud. I could have spun up uh, a password sync organization also, which is doing SSO using its password, which are password hashes which are getting synced, but you wouldn't have seen any difference. Uh, and all of the sign-ins happening uh, in AAD, and we saw a multi-factor auth sign-in also happen, and your application taking advantage of all of those different auth mechanisms uh, without doing much, really. Right? If you're using uh, WIF, all of the magic just happens with WIF. If you're using simple sample PHP, that is also pretty simple. Actually, I, I promise that I'll show you a simple sample PHP application also. So I created one last night. I, I don't know PHP. Uh, I've never programmed on it. But it was pretty simple to configure AAD using simple sample PHP, where all I did was uh, I basically created a signin.php one page, which what it does is just creates a SAML request and posts it, right? Sets a binding. Should I zoom it? Yeah. It creates a SAML request, sets the binding, and submits it. And on the index, it receives the request or uh, the SAML response, and it shows you all the assertions, the issuer, the not before, the audience, the name ID, and all the claims. I, again, registered this application in my AAD, and uh, it actually is a very <laughs> simple application. This is signin.php, which is this. It has one button. It's going to post a, a request. So this one was my using my tenant. And it's receiving back the response on its index.php, which is uh, looking at all the name ID claims, et cetera. It's interpreting that. I added a uh, simple SAML PHP folder to this app, published my app on Azure websites. It gave me HTTPS, and it just worked. Right? I mean, even in simple SAML PHP, it was just a couple of lines. I've uh, worked with developers. Uh, of ISVs using OpenSAML and integrating their uh, uh, SaaS applications, ISV applications using OpenSAML. That was pretty easy, too. So really, now what, what you have is in Azure AD a mechanism which is doing all the heavy lifting of taking and projecting the identities from on-premise or for small businesses in the cloud 
and your application can just connect to it and uh, offload all of the identity management and these various secure mechanisms of signing in to Azure AD. It's free uh, for up to, I believe, 500,000 identities. That's a lot of identities. MFA, multi-factor auth, for uh, users is uh, a paid service, but for administrators is free. Uh, and uh, it's pretty feature-rich. I recommend that you go to uh, the MSDN page and take a look at it. If you want to play around with all of the authentication protocols and the messages, uh, go to my app, which I've built, workaad.com, register your tenant with it, and uh, post SAML WSFED messages to it, spin up Fiddler, see what comes in, goes out, and see the internals of AAD. It's a highly scalable service, highly scaled service, 14 data centers, great availability, serving what, 50 billion authentication requests in last week. That's the number which Girish quoted, right, in his introduction talk. Mind-boggling. I mean, I know uh, with these, all these millions of numbers of apps and everything, we've been desensitized to millions and billions. But the fact is, it's a pretty mature service which is serving pretty big online services already. So take a look at it, evaluate it, and play with it. Yeah? Cool. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sitting with me here. <laughs>